Can anybody hear me? Yes, sir. I don't know what kind of uh, mercurial uh, cosmic crap was happening, but I was uh, in uh, <laughs> Zoom hell there for about 10 minutes. Happens to the best of us. Doreen, are you there somewhere? <laughs> she's got her camera on for the office. <laughs> I don't think she's at the office. Camera just automatically turns on. Yeah, I'm not sure what that's all about. <clears throat> well, it's uh, seven o'clock. And James, do you see anybody participating from the outside? You're muted. Thank you. I see us here as panelists and I see four attendees, Brandon, Joe, Sophia and Wix. Okay, good. So I think, I think there's a quorum, barely. We technically have a quorum, yes, but as uh, what we can mention at the very beginning, any, any tie votes will end as a vote as a no overall. We, do you want me to check them or? Melinda said she probably wouldn't be here. Right. She was going to do her best, but. I would say let's give them just uh, five minutes. And if not, we can get started. I didn't hear anything from Chip, so I assumed he was coming. I'll text Chip right now and see if he responds. going to try to remember to find a flag and hang it behind me that way we'll always have a flag for the pledge of allegiance i know i should <laughs> i should probably do the same i have the old unofficial main flag but i doubt that would count we would have to come up with our own pledge to the state of maine Well, we might as well, I would say, Mr. Chair, we might as well get started and get through the first few things on the agenda anyway. And um, agree. If, if we get people to join uh, later, we'll add them in. Okay. Are we recording? Do we need to uh, sign signal to anyone? Um, I believe the recording button is on. If it isn't, Doreen will do so momentarily. I, okay. I think it's on. All right. Then I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so welcome everyone. It is the uh, January 13, 2021 regular meeting of the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the meeting will now come to order. Uh, this is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes and goes into executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all of the exhibits that are presented. Uh, please notify the chairperson, which is myself, if you are unable to hear or see the proceedings. 
Uh, the board works from a prepared agenda, public agenda, and we'll take up tonight's items in the following order. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So look at your flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, may we do roll call, please? Certainly. Mr. Bork? Present. Mr. Karen? Present. Ms. Shoup? Here. Mr. Hebert? Present. Mr. Howe? <laughs> Ms. Torrens? Okay. Next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the December 9th, 2020 meeting. Do I have a motion uh, on the floor to accept the minutes? Uh, first off, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from last December? And are there any questions about the content or the statements that have been made? Excellent. No. Uh, seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from December 9th? Mr. Bork? Yes, um, Mr. Chair, a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting for December 9th. Excellent. Is there a second? I move to second. Excellent. All those in favor? Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Karen? Aye. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I also vote aye as well. So seeing no conflict there, the minutes from December 9th are approved. Next, we have the approval of the draft written decision for appeal heard at the December 9th meeting, appeal number 2698. Has everyone had a chance to review the findings of fact from that December meeting? Uh, everyone is comfortable with the content and aware of the content that is in there. If there aren't any questions, I will take a motion uh, from the floor to approve the draft written decision for appeal 2698. Mr. Chair. Uh, motion to approve uh, the appeal writ number 2698 as written. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Is there a second? I move to second. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Karen. Uh, we will now vote to approve the draft written decisions. Mr. Bork? Aye. Mr. Karen? Aye. Ms. Shoup? Yes. Excellent. And I vote in aye as well. Next is the second approval of draft written decisions for it was a um, setback determination by the Proud's Neck Yacht Club. Do I have a motion on the floor to accept the findings that have been made in that particular instance? Mr. Bork. Yes, a motion to approve uh, the draft written decision regarding the setback determination uh, by the Proud's Neck Yacht Club. Excellent. Second. I move to second. Great. And uh, if there aren't any additional comments on the content of the setback determination, Seeing none, I will um, go to you, Mr. Bork. How do you vote? Aye. Excellent. Mr. Carey? Karen? Aye. Ms. Shoup? Yes. Excellent. And I agree as well. So folks, before we get into the peels this evening, I wanted to just kind of go through um, some of the opening remarks here. I'll, I'll mention these earlier in the future. Um, in each instance on each application that is presented before the Board of Zoning, Zoning Board of Appeals, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the, applica of the applicant's appeal. The Board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony is heard, the Chairman will close the record and the Board will adopt findings of fact for each criteria of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet that criteria. It is important to know that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the Board must deny the appeal or application. So it is critical that all points of each application are met and accepted by the Board. In many cases, the appellant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the appellant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criterion, a motion may be made to approve the appeal, and if there's a second, discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on the motion, 
In most cases, the board will request that staff prepare a draft written decision based on the stated findings and conclusions, as well as the audio, video, and supporting materials in the record for approval at our next meeting, which is what we just did on last month's findings. A general vote will be then taken on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date the vote was taken, regardless of the approval of a final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of this board's decision. Also, if anyone present at this hearing uh, may wish to preserve your individual right to file any such appeal, you must be certain that this board's rec record, uh, <clears throat> recorded evidence, uh, make sure that the board records your appearance this evening and the basis for your support or opposition. So if you wish to, um, if you wish to speak on an application, that opportunity will be presented to you when we open the floor for public discussion. Again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding and you have the right to hear and see what is happening. All persons speaking will be asked to state first state their name and address or affiliation, and all board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions through the chair, which is me. So first, we uh, let's go right into it. Appeal number 2695. This is a practical difficulty variance appeal by Northeast Civil Solutions on behalf of Wix, uh, pardon the... Uh, Please forgive my pronunciation, Rossiter and Leela Schuler, nine Pinewood Circle, assessor's map U017, lot 72. I believe we have someone here who is um, here on behalf of the applicant to speak. And Brian, may we bring them in the discussion? Sure. Um, I think Doreen will handle that and allow them to speak. Um, while they're while she's doing that, I'll give you just a brief rundown of the uh, variance appeal. It is a practical difficulty variance appeal uh, for Nine Pinewood Circle. The applicant owns a one and a half story Cape style home uh, on a uh, five thousand square foot lot. Um, the cottage was built in 1957. Um, it is non-conforming with regard to front and side setback. Uh, the lot is non-conforming as it was uh, you know, developed long before the zoning ordinance. So it's 5,000 square feet. Obviously the R2 zone requires 100, uh, 100 feet of frontage and 20,000 square feet of lot area. The appellant wishes to add a 10 by 12 foot detached garage. They wish to place it five feet from the easterly side property line and three feet from the northerly rear property line. Uh, this would require variances of 10 feet and 12 feet respective, respectively from the required 15 foot side and rear setbacks. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to the appellants and or their representative, whoever wishes to speak and um, let them give you more uh, detail on that appeal. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this is Jim Fisher. I'm here with Brandon Bennett this evening. Uh, we're at our office. Uh, Mr. and Dr. Uh, uh, Rossiter are at their homes, and Joseph Iskey uh, should also be on. Uh, he is uh, with Perkins Thompson, and uh, Joe will be doing most of the presentation this evening. But uh, I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of um, essentially this project. Brian pretty well summed it up. Essentially, what happens is we've got a, a very small area, a very small lot in the area of Prout's Neck. Um, this lot, as Brian mentioned, was, uh, was built upon uh, quite a number of years ago, well before zoning was enacted. And uh, the house itself is not in the... Uh, can you still, can everybody still see me and hear me? Uh, we hear you clearly. Um, we're looking I'm at sorry, I'm, I'm uh, sc sharing screen to bring up the plans, Jim. Oh, keep great. keep on you. going. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Essentially, what we have is the Rossiters purchased this property in uh, about six years ago and uh, with the intent of having it be a main property. They were not from Maine at the time. They are now. Um, they did not believe at the time that they were going to be making this their uh, full permanent residence. Uh, instead, it was given the Prout's Neck area, it was going to be a, uh, a summer or a three season cottage. And it was that way for quite a number of years. Uh, they were here in 2015 requesting a variance 
uh, to be able to build out a, an upper portion of the house because the house, as Brian mentioned earlier, is uh, almost completely forward of the building envelope. And uh, in doing so, they also then put a, uh, a screened in porch or an enclosed porch in the back within the building envelope. So there was no issue there. And uh, they did come up to uh, uh, just a small percentage away from the maximum lot coverage at the time. Since then, uh, they have decided that they are going to make this their uh, permanent residence and have done so. Uh, they now live here uh, full time. And uh, in conjunction with that year round, they would like to be able to just uh, replace the shed that they have in the back corner of their property uh, with a garage, just a single car garage, nothing special, just literally to be able to uh, hold a, a, a medium sized vehicle that would be able to, uh, to access it quite easily. The Pine Ridge Circle is a road that's only about 14 feet wide. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge anyway. The driveway is only looking at about uh, eight to nine feet wide. And then the, uh, the driveway, the, the new proposed garage would be tucked in the back corner. There is a garage that's in, from the immediate abutter on the right hand side that's literally on the front on the line. Uh, and there is a house that's immediately behind them that's only about three to four feet from the back line. So you can get an idea from the um, density of the lots that are in this area that uh, everybody is, while not on top of each other, are certainly close. The point being is that the abutters on both the right and in the rear have indicated to uh, Mr. Rossiter that there is no issue as far as they're concerned. Uh, in fact, putting a garage by being able to then move the vehicles uh, from the front yard into uh, the garage or vehicle uh, would actually enhance the character of the neighborhood a little bit. I'll let Joe uh, take a look at that or, or um, speak to that a little bit more later. What I would like to call out though to your attention is in your packets, just after the, the section of photographs, there is a, um, a zoning map, blow up of the zoning map of Prout's Neck. Uh, this is essentially what we're looking at. What I'd like to point out here is you know, in the R2 zone, of which all of Prout's Neck uh, is a part all the way up to Ferry Road and just beyond that, take a look at the, uh, the overall sizes of the properties, notwithstanding the country club itself, which is obviously huge. Most of the rest of these properties are anywhere from uh, under about 4,000 square feet at the very smallest um, up to uh, several acres, quite a number of acres. What I'd like to point out is on that uh, sheet, you'll see right toward the top of it, we have a project site, the word project site, and then an arrow pointing to uh, the actual property that is occupied by the Rossiters. Um, again, that's on this particular map here. What you'll see is uh, at the top of Barrier Lane, uh, where it says Barrier Lane on this sheet, in the open area of the V of Barrier Lane, you'll see a very tiny lot, a little square. That's the locust property. Relative to all the rest of these properties, which are considerably larger, in some cases, uh, several acres. The point I'm making is that when zoning went into effect, uh, all of these properties, and we know with master planning and, and how zoning has to be, and it has to encompass all properties in a particular area, uh, so uh, notwithstanding contract zones, the, uh, the properties or the zoning encompasses everything. In this particular case, where most of these properties have room to spare, as it were, because most of the houses, as you can see from what Brian's brought up right here, most of the houses are generally similar in size. They're fairly small to a little bit larger, nothing super grandiose until you actually get down into the, uh, uh, the Prouts Neck area, um, Winslow Homer Road, et cetera. The point I'm making is that uh, this lot which is subject to the same zoning as every other lot here is one of the smallest lots in this entire area. So notwithstanding that the houses are generally the same or very similar, the lot on which it sits is exceptionally limited. Most of the people in this area, and you can see from the photograph, have garages, not all, but the vast majority of them. And we're just looking to, again, to replace that shed in the back corner uh, with a simple one car garage that would allow uh, the Rossiters who are retired and are getting a little bit older, uh, the ability throughout the main winter and inclement weather to be able to just access a single car that would be parked in the garage and just make life easier for them. Toward that end, I would then turn it over to uh, Joe Zavisky, uh, if he's with us, and then Joe will take us through the, uh, the rest of the project. Thank, Thank you, you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, first of all, can everyone uh, hear me okay? Yes, sir. Great. Well, thanks again. Uh, I, I think Jim has introduced the, the project rather well, so um, I don't need to 
to rehash what the introduction he's already given. What I'd like to do is um, I had submitted a, a letter to the board um, in advance of, a, of the December meeting, um, uh, which addresses each of the uh, standards in the ordinance uh, for practical difficulty variances. And um, if it's all right with the board, I'd like to just walk through that letter um, and talk about each of the standards uh, one by one and, and why we think that uh, the, the variance should be granted in this case. So, excuse um, me, Joe, sure. if, I, if I can interrupt you just for one quick moment. Um, Mr. Longstaff, would that be best to do once we get to, I mean, at this point, we're asking the questions. Are we just moving straight to that point? Um, that's uh, that's at your discretion. Um, I think it would be duplicative and repetitive, um, Joe, if you went through all of the points on your letter addressing each of the criteria, the board generally will then go back and go through those same criteria and look for a response from the applicant. So we might be able okay. to do that at the same time to allow you your response, if that's okay with you. Okay, that, yeah. that's fine, whatever the board. I think that would make the most yeah. sense if the board sure. agrees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess let me just give a, a a brief overview then, just to build upon what what Jim has already said, and a couple of things that that um, th that struck me in in doing the research and preparing uh, uh, the letter. Um, first of all, when you're looking at the uh, the the general condition of of the neighborhood, uh, there's a there's a law court case, a, a main Supreme Court case that says that that's uh, the present condition of the neighborhood. So when the board is reviewing this application, um, it's not what this neighborhood looked like decades ago when it was mostly sea cut, seaside cottages. It's what it looks like today, which is, uh, which has been over the years a transition to uh, a neighborhood consisting primarily of, of, of single family homes and, and full year round residences as, as I understand it. So I guess that's one, one thing to keep in mind um, as the board uh, re reviews um, this this application and another thing just to you know what Jim said about this being one of the smallest lots in the R2 district um, it's it's more than just that 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 create the unique circumstances here it's it's the um, <clears throat> it's the side and rear setbacks um, that are applicable in the R2 district of 40 feet in the front and 15 feet in the side and rear. And when you apply that to, you know, a typical conforming lot in the R2 district, it's 20,000 square feet, that would yield 4,000 square feet of buildable area, which is, you know, generally speaking, plenty of room on which to build a single family residence and a garage um, and any other of the permitted uses in the R2 district. But, but here that would leave um, a building envelope of of just 24 by 32, 810 square feet. So those are the unique circumstances here, and that's what creates the need um, for variance in the in this case. And um, let's just see if I have another comment I'd like to make, and um, just another point before we, you know, you know, before we get into the board's questions. Um, when you're looking at a practical difficulty variance it's the uh, it's the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance would preclude a use of property that is permitted in the district and result in significant economic injury to the applicant so that, there's another case that's sort of speaks to this requirement and um, what it, what it says is that <coughs> the the inquiry that the board should be making is the is the proposed use of of the property by the applicant that is before the board so um, here, this is this would involve the the Rossiter's proposed use of the property, not not whether a hypothetical property owner might have utilized the property in a different way. You know, you might have a, a property owner that doesn't need or want a garage associated with their their house, but um, here there's a legitimate need for that for the Rossiter's uh, to have one, um, and that would be. Uh, the relevant inquiry as far as the the board's uh, decision on on this particular application. So, I guess I'll leave it at that. I I you know I can address each and every one of the standards um, and and any questions the board might have. 
on any of them. So I'd be happy to okay. uh, entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fisiziviski. I appreciate that. Does the board have any questions at this time about the application or anything that's been discussed thus far? We're talking about a proposed 12 by 18 garage in the back corner. Mr. Hubert. Yes. Uh, just a point of order. I think at this point we should mention that uh, while we do have a quorum, a tie would result in a no decision. Yes, thank you for mentioning that, Mr. Bork. Uh, I briefly alluded to this earlier. Uh, since there are four voting members tonight, if there is a two to tie, the application will be denied. Just so that we were putting that on the record. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, any questions pertaining to the application or the applicants? Excuse me, Mr. Chair, one uh, general question. Go for it. For tonight's application. I understand as we're going to do it that there are some dimensional um, criteria requested as part of the variance. Is the uh, overall site square footage part of that variance as well? And by that, I mean the over the 20% buildable. Yes, if I may answer that, Mr. Chair, sorry. Um, so it's a setback from the um, the side and rear, um, a variance from the, the side and rear setbacks as well as the lot coverage, which is 20% uh, in the R2 district, which, you know, for a 20,000 square foot lot, that's 4,000 square feet. But here it's due to the size of the lot, 810 square feet. So, yes. Great. All right, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Chair, I'd, li I'd like to ask the applicant, do you want me to continue to share screen and show the, the site plan or would you rather stop me stop sharing the screen at this point? What's more useful to you? I don't have a, I don't have a preference one way or the other, Jim. I don't know if you, how you feel about it. I think it's fine to leave it up as is. Okay, um, okay. just Great. let me know if you want to go to any specific page or sheet in your plan views and I'm happy Great. to do that, okay? Right. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Much. And I think the site plan tells the story uh, very well here. So seeing no other comments or questions from the board, what we're going to do at this point is go into the questions. So now we're going to go through each point of the pra practical difficulty application. Um, and uh, Mr. Savisky, uh, you can read in um, either the entire or um, enough of the enough of your written response to satisfy the question. So we'll start with uh, number one. The need for variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. You're looking for a, re a response from me, Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, so uh, understanding that we do have this uh, also well-written documents in front of us, we need to have it read into the gotcha. record just so that it's recorded uh, audio gotcha. and video. Great, well, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. So here the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Uh, the Maine Supreme Court, as I had indicated in my opening comments, has uh, confirmed that the general conditions means the present conditions of the neighborhood. In other words, those existing at the time of the variance application. Uh, the present, uh, and that comes from a case of o O'Toole versus City of Portland from 2004. The present conditions of the neighborhood are depicted on the map included as an exhibit to the letter that I submitted to the board, uh, which is taken from GIS maps available on the town of Scarborough's website. As depicted on exhibit A, the unique circumstances of the property are at small size of 0.11 acres or 5,000 square feet, combined with the restrictive dimensional requirements applicable to lots in the R2 district, which results in an exceedingly small building envelope on the property. Under the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, minimum lot area in the R2 district is 20,000 square feet. A lot this size would allow for 4,000 square feet of building coverage without exceeding the 20% building coverage limit in the R2 district. Here, however, the property consists of a grandfathered 5,000 square foot lot created prior to the adoption of the R2 district dimensional standards. The use of the 40 foot front yard and 15 foot side and rear yards in the R2 district, oh, excuse me, Oh, it was further uh, limited by the those restrictive setbacks. Applying these setbacks to the property leaves the building envelope of only 24.77 feet by 32.69 feet as is shown on the site plan on the screen right now. Total area of just under 810 square feet. 
This exceptionally small building envelope is inadequate to accommodate even a modest single, single family home, let alone an accessory structure, both of which are expressly permitted in the R2 district. And that's according to the zoning ordinance section um, 15B1. While there are other small parcels in the neighborhood, Exhibit A demonstrates uh, that parcels in the neighborhood actually vary considerably in size and dimension, and that several parcels in the immediate vicinity already have detached garages or are large enough to accommodate one. Um, for all these reasons, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Excellent, thank you. Question two, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. So yeah, the granting of a variance will not produce any undesirable changes in the character of the neighborhood. Rather, the granting of the variance will bring the property more in conformance with the character of the, of the neighborhood, which has evolved over time from seasonal cottages to year round residences several of which already have detached garages or accessory structures, including three Pinewood Circle, seven Pinewood Circle, which is immediately next door to the property, eight Pinewood Circle, 10 Pinewood Circle, 14 Pinewood Circle, and 20 Pinewood Circle. The addition of a one-car garage will not affect the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Furthermore, Mr. Rossiter has personally communicated with all immediate neighbors and no one has raised any objections to the construction of the proposed garage. Excellent, thank you. Pardon me, Mr. Chair? Yes. Is it appropriate to ask questions at this time? Uh, I'll allow a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the question I have with regard to abutting properties, uh, I don't recall seeing any information regarding the construction of the proposed uh, garage. And I noticed that on the plan uh, to the south, or plan north, um, to the rear of the proposed garage, there is a nearby structure. And I didn't know um, for distances and the proposed distance away from the existing structure, what sort of uh, wall assembly for the proposed garage has been considered. Um, I believe it's just uh, going to be a, a, a concrete floor with a, a stick built garage, wooden frame. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll keep going. Number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. The practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Rather, the practical difficulty is due to the subsequent adoption of the R2 district dimensional standards many years after the lot comprising the property was created and the original structure on the property was built. While it is true that the Rossiters purchased the property after these zoning restrictions had been adopted, the Maine Supreme Judicial Court has unequivocally stated that purchasing a property with actual or constructive knowledge of the zoning restrictions does not preclude the issuance of a variance. And that comes from the case of Twig versus Town of Kennebunk, a 1995 case. The court in Twig further stated, while it was the general rule at one time that one who purchased property with actual or constructive knowledge of the restrictions of a zoning ordinance was barred from securing a variance, the rule has since been altogether abandoned or modified into non-existence in most jurisdictions. The modern rule provides that a purchase, purchase with knowledge does not preclude the granting of a variance and at most is considered a non-determinative factor in consideration of a variance. Uh, there's another case, Rochelot versus the town of Green, which confirmed that knowledge of zoning ordinance restrictions by a purchaser of non-conforming lot without more will hardly ever constitute a self-created hardship. And, and that case further reasoned that few parties will be willing to purchase a non-conforming lot that cannot be developed even, with, even when the other variance requirements are met. Furthermore, knowledge that variances have been granted under similar circumstances can mitigate a prior purchaser's uh, knowledge of zoning restrictions, and that comes from the case of Wiper versus City of South Portland. Uh, here, the, the Rossiter's backyard neighbor, Scott Doherty, was granted a variance to construct a garage in 2005, and I've attached a copy of the certificate of variance to the letter that I submitted to the board. Uh, in 2015, the Rossiter sought and obtained a variance to renovate the house on the property. 
I think Jim alluded to that earlier. The same year he had obtained a building permit to add a mudroom and screen porch within the conforming building window behind the existing house. And if you'll see on the site plan on the screen, the, uh, the, the addition of the, it just says screen porch there. It's about the only thing that fits uh, in, in the building envelope on the, on the property. Uh, did not require a variance. Um, it's important to note that the renovations and the addition were completed prior to Mr. Rossiter's retirement at a time when the Rossiter's contemplated use of the property was a seasonal residence. It was only after Mr. Rossiter retired in 2018 that the Rossiter's decided to make the property their permanent residence. In comments stated uh, October 14th, 2020, town staff noted that the addition of the mudroom and screen porch in the conforming building envelope behind the existing house on the property could have accommodated the garage without the need for a variance. As explained in the application, the garage cannot be located in this area because vehicle access to the garage would require making a, a 90 degree turn in an area too small to allow for an adequate turning radius. And here we've submitted actually a, um, um, an additional uh, diagram um, that Northeast Civil Solutions prepared indicating um, how um, entry and exit um, from a to and from a garage uh, in that location would look. It's uh, it's very inconvenient and would require a, a multi point turn. So really not an option. Um, let's see here. So even if the if the screen porch and mudroom had not been constructed in the allowable building envelope on the property, this area could not have accommodated the garage which the Rossiters are seeking to build now. Furthermore, there does not appear to be any main case law that precludes the issuance of a variance due to the presence of lawful improvements constructed without the need for a variance. Excellent, thank you. Number four, no uh, other- One me. question, please, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll allow it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Savisky. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I understand that screen and porch uh, was put in at the time of the addition upwards, uh, which brought the lot coverage to 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, could you know the square footage of that uh, screened in porch and mudroom? I do not have that information at my fingertips. I don't know, Jim, if, if you might be able to comment um, on that. It is, uh, it's 17 feet deep from the house toward the back of the lot and 14 feet wide. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, then that's uh, more than the square footage of the proposed garage. And uh, had, had the uh, owner not put that uh, mudroom and screened in portion, uh, you would be coming before us today with a request for a garage that would uh, bring the total lot coverage to within the 20%. Um, and while there would be uh, setbacks on the side and, and rear, which we could certainly consider, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any kind of an issue. So the point I'm making is that it was the, it was the decision of the owner to put in the, the screen and porch and the mudroom, you know, which is you know, creating this issue with the 20% coverage which would not have been a problem had they not done that. So I just want to make that point. Uh, any comment? No, that's a that's a fair point. Uh, and I guess what I would say in response is that, regardless of whether or not that mudroom was there, um, locating a garage on any on any part of this property would have required a variance. Um, as as you see now, it's it's. It needs a variance from the side and rear setbacks. Um, even in, in comments from staff dated January 13th, 2021, seems to acknowledge that it's really impractical to put the, the garage um, in the building envelope um, on the property, assuming the screen porch and mudroom weren't there. Um, even that would have required, um, at a minimum, a, a limited reduction uh, weight uh, variance. So, regardless of of and of whether the mudroom is there or not, the garage needs a variance. 
the other point I'd add to that, uh, Joe and uh, David, is um, again, harking back to the, the size of this property. This is one of the half a dozen smallest properties that are in that overall area. And uh, while that is a condition of the area, um, as far as the size of the properties is concerned, most people, as Joe had indicated earlier, particularly in this zone but in any zone, have lots that are usually bigger than this and certainly configured to the point where it would allow a, uh, a greater flexibility of being able to construct something. What we have here is uh, in a zone with uh, 90 plus percent, almost 95 plus percent of all this, the lots and the houses on them being considerably larger than this one, we still have the, some, the same zoning regulations that refer to this, which just makes it a very practical difficulty to be able to do much with this lot, um, to be able to make it essentially livable and habitable as a year round residence. Uh, Mr. Chair, one follow up yes. question, if you will. Uh, brief, if you would, please, Mr. Bork. Very quickly, I was not really trying to make that point whatsoever. I was just simply pointing out that it was the decision of the owner uh, at the time of the uh, upward expansion to add the mudroom, and that created the issue as far as lot coverage. Okay. Moving along, uh, we're going to move on to number five. We just read four, correct? Yes. No. We were just about to start for it. Thank you. No other feasible alternative is available uh, except a variance in this application. So given the property's small lot size and the restrictive setback requirements applicable in the R2 district, there is no other feasible location for a garage on the property. As stated in the variance application, the Rossiters wish to make the property their year-round residence, but in order to be able to live at the property year-round, need to need a place to safely park, enter, and exit their vehicle, in particular during the winter months when snow and ice present a safety hazard. Um, and I should note, in addition to what I've written in the letter that I submitted to the board, um, there, is a, there is a case that provides some, some guidance on this particular standard. And, and, and the inquiry is that um, no other feasible alternative is available except a variance, meaning a variant, any variance period, not the particular variance sought in this application. So, and I think we've sort of established that with the earlier discussion um, relating to the other standards, but that's all I had with respect to number four. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Savisky. Number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Right, and as I, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the letter I submitted, uh, the granting of a variance here would result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties, several of which are already improved with detached garages or similar accessory structures. I can list them off again, but uh, I think I've already mentioned them earlier, so I trust Great. that you remember. <laughs> we know, we understand, thank you. <laughs> Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. As stated in the application, granting the variance will not have an unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. The proposed, uh, the purpose for the variance will be to allow the construction of a modest 240 square foot structure. The property is not located in a shoreland zone, not located in a flood zone. Minimal, if any, impacts on the natural environment are anticipated. Number seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area or flood hazard zone. Right, and as I just stated, uh, the property is not located in the shoreland zone, not located in a flood hazard zone. Number eight, <clears throat> strict application of the dimensional standards of the zoning ordinance would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the residential two district and result in significant economic injury to the Rossiters. The Rossiters are seeking to construct a one car, 240 square foot garage, a use which is permitted in the R2 district in which the property is located. Um, and that's according to zoning ordinance section 15 B1, which is which allows single family detached dwellings and accessory uses in the R2 district, among other permitted uses. 
Upon Mr. Rossiter's retirement in 2018, the Rossiters decided to move to Scarborough permanently and make the property their primary residence. Since that time, a Dr. Schuler has continued to practice as an obstetrician gynecologist in Boston. She frequently leaves for work in the dark before dawn, arrives home late at night. During the winter months, a garage would eliminate the need for snow and ice removal from her vehicle prior to departure and would provide a way to safely park, enter, and exit the vehicle. Without the garage, the Rossiters would be precluded from safely using their property year-round. The Rossiters sold their a Massachusetts home in anticipation of their permanent move to Scarborough. They are unable to safely use their nine Pinewood Circle home during the winter months and be forced to find more suitable winter lodging at great cost. Accordingly, the application uh, of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the R2 district and would result in significant economic injury to the Rossiters. Okay, thank you. At this time, Mr. Longstaff, uh, are we going to public comment at this time? Or are we discussing each of the points in the practical application with the board members? I think uh, opening a public hearing would be the appropriate uh, thing to do right here. Then we will do that. Uh, consider the public here, public portion of this meeting open. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak? And if you are in the chat as a participant or as an attendee, uh, please raise your hand. There's a little button to raise your hand. I see zero attendees. I think everybody is here on this call. Uh, Mr. Longstaff, do we receive any? Um, oh, Mr. Rossiter would like to speak. Mr. Rossiter, you certainly may speak and do so. Mr. Rossiter. Um, has he unmuted himself? According to uh, Zoom, he is unmuted. Okay. Uh, and he just left. He's now an attendee. Maybe he needs to be brought back in as a panelist. Or maybe he doesn't want to speak. I imagine he might be uh, having some technical difficulties. So. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'll give you a moment. Does that ever happen? Does anyone ever have technical difficulties with Zoom? I never <laughs> in my entire life had an issue with Zoom, and that's a lie. Um, I guess, is there another way for Mr. Rossiter to speak with us if he wishes to? If you want to, so you can also type in the chat uh, if you have a question that you would like to state, Mr. Rossiter, or something that you would like to mention. Uh, I guess while we're figuring that out, Mr. Longstaff, have we received any um, emails, phone calls, written emails from any neighbors or other members of the public? Uh, no, the only uh, letter we received was from Mr. Savisky, which ended up really being a supplemental um, application for the applicant. So I, I didn't receive anything from any other uh, individuals. Understood. Okay. I guess at this point, we're going to move into the questions among the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Savisky and Mr. Fisher for your presentation. We'll call upon you guys for any further questions as we have them. Uh, but now we're going to be having a discussion with the board to go through each of the points of the practical difficulty application and establishing our findings of fact and conclusions of law. So first, we'll start with the need for variances due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. So we'll go in alphabetical order here, starting with Mr. Bork. Yes, this is an exceptionally small lot uh, for this particular neighborhood, uh, so it is. Uh, certainly due to the unique circumstances of, of this property compared to the other properties around it. Mr. Karen. Agreed that this need is due to the small lot size as was um, shared with the adjacent property plan uh, for the area and district, um, not necessarily the neighborhood. Um, I'll also mention that the, uh, the property in the R2 district, this requires at least 20,000 20, square feet of area um, 
and this is certainly much significantly smaller than that. And with the current restrictions on the side front and rear setbacks, it limits their building coverage to 20% of this area. Um, the applicant later obtained a building permit where they added this small mudroom into this space back in 2015. And uh, Mr. Longstaff, other properties in the area in Pinewood Circle, oh, they have similar size, multiple properties, single garages, no garages, uh, very small, um, um, small lot footprints. There are, there are a handful of lots that are the same size or smaller. But as the applicant also pointed out, there are a number of lots that are significantly larger. So it's very, it's not a very consistent um, configuration of lots in that Pinewood Circle neighborhood, um, which is, <laughs> which is not unique in Scarborough, by the way. But <laughs> no, uh, certainly not. Uh, it doesn't bear necessarily bear on on this um, on this application. But yep. uh, yeah, there there are some properties that are similar in size, and in fact, there's one that has. Um, that's about the same size and has two front setbacks. So they're, they're doubly imposed. Um, right. But yeah. Great. I also note the building was constructed in approximately 1957. So obviously back then there were, there's, there was no zoning ordinance to be building or carving out any lots by. All right, let's move on to actually at this point, um, I'll take a vote on from the board members. We'll vote on this one and then we'll move to the next one. So all those in favor of the requirements of number one being met, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will concur as an I as well. Number two, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Mr. Bork? Uh, this would uh, actually make the uh, property more consistent with the other properties in the neighborhood by adding a garage. That's something that's very common um, in this neighborhood. So it doesn't really have any kind of a uh, negative impact uh, on the uh, neighborhood. Mr. Karen? Agreed that um, the proposed garage would not have a negative impact on the neighborhood, but also on the perceived use of the abutting properties. Ms. Shoup. Um, I don't think it'll produce an undesirable change. However, I do think that, you know, the other garages that are detached or are attached to the other properties probably aren't up against the line and so jammed into their tiny little lots like that. So I do, um, you know, think it will be a little bit different than the other ones with that much coverage on such a small lot. I'll also include uh, the applicant stated that they've spoken to neighbors and no one has uh, objected to the project, nor have we received any indications of objections from neighbors via written note or email. Um, and the addition, as Ms. Shoup pointed out, it's within three feet of the property line. So it is pretty tight in there. And again, speaking to the smaller um, postage stamp size uh, lots scattered throughout this area. Uh, so all those in favor of the requirements of number two being met, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. Number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner, Mr. Bork. Well, in this case, it is the result of a prior action by adding the mudroom and the screened in porch, uh, you know, which was their choice. Uh, it brought the lot coverage up to the full 20%. So it, it very clearly is uh, an action by the current owner. Mr. Karen? I agree that um, one of the first clarifying questions I had asked was with regard to the lot coverage. And it would appear that in 2015, with the vertical expansion and mudroom, um, that there were some previous actions of the owner that may not have been an issue with this variance request today. Um, going on some of the further conversations, there would still be a need for a variance, though based upon uh, later restrictions placed upon the site. Excellent, and Ms. Shoup? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is a difficult one. Um, you know, I think the board is sympathetic to the situation that they are in. Um, you know, the owners came to the town in 2015, and they are very well aware of the limits that were placed on this property. And they chose to take that variance and do what they did at that time. It sounds to me, and I mean, this is information that they've provided for this evening. It's sounds like a change of circumstance. You know, they bought the house as a summer home and now they've changed their mind and they want to go from a summer home to a full-time residence, which we're sympathetic to. But, it's, you know, it, as we just discussed in the prior um, criteria, you know, it's a very difficult lot to deal with. And, um, you know, coming twice for a variance and seeing kind of the difficulty of that particular lot. Yes, I do think that the applicants sort of put themselves in this situation now and 2015 made that choice. Thank you. Um, though it is worthy of note that in the initial purchase of this property, it wasn't in the, I'll say the overall master plan of the applicant to construct a garage here as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll add as well, they, uh, back in the December 18th document that was submitted for town review, uh, there was a pl uh, plan that demonstrates that should, ha should a garage had been placed in the location of the mudroom and sunroom where it currently stands, the ability for a vehicle to navigate its way into there, driving in and backing out would pose um, a significant challenge for any size, medium-sized vehicle that would be going in there. Um, I would, in, in looking at in looking at this plan, um, I would say that that wouldn't be a logical choice for to have a garage there. Period, at all, um, and they would, as Ms. Shu pointed out, they would still have to come before the board uh, for for a variance should any garage needed had been placed there. Seeing that, uh, let's go to the. Uh, vote on the requirements of number three being met. I'll start with you, Mr. Bork. No. Okay, Mr. Karen. Yes. Ms. Shoup. No. Okay. And I vote yes. And that is a tie. This one does not pass. Uh, number four, no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except a variance. Mr. Bork. Uh, yes, this would be uh, the only feasible alternative. Okay, Mr. Karen. When looking at the proposed plan, um, I can foresee that potential other placements on the site would um, reduce, potentially reduce the requested needs um, for setbacks, particularly the rear setback, should the garage have been moved forward. However, as was discussed, um, this standard is uh, simply a variance in general. So I do believe a variance would still be needed. Ms. Shoup. Yes, I agree. I think they've done a very good job at showing that this really is the only available option. Okay, I agree as well. And they've also stated that when snow and ice are present, posing a safety hazard, they would need to have some sort of vehicle structure here for that. Um, all those in favor of the requirements of four being met, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. Uh, number five, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Mr. Bork. Yes, again, surrounding properties, uh, most have garages, not all, but it's certainly consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Mr. Karen. Yes, agreed. Um, while some properties may not have garages, some do, and I do not see that this would be an adverse impact. Ms. Shoup. Um, I feel like the addition of the garage and the coverage of the lot would um, not bring it into more conformance with the surrounding areas. Again, I feel like it's covering more of just, it's unfortunate that they bought, I mean, they bought a small lot, um, but you know, we're looking at percentages and lot coverages. And I just, you know, I think when they add another coverage and they're 
and jamming it all in there, um, I, I don't think it is in conformance. Good. And for my notes, uh, the applicant stated that a lot of the other properties in this area, they're being converted to year round re residences that have garages. Um, though obviously it was pointed out the, the lot sizes in these areas very wildly. Um, some are small and some are large. So all those in favor of the requirements of number five being met, uh, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? No. And I will vote yes. Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Mr. Bork? Uh, no, it would not. Okay, Mr. Uh, Karen? Agreed. Based on the placement, I don't see an uh, issue with uh, the existing soils or vegetation surrounding. Um, so no concerns. Ms. Shoup? Agreed. I don't think it'll have any adverse effect. It looks like the pictures and everything they provided, it doesn't look they'd be making a lot of changes to the, to the lot there to add it. And I'll add the, uh, I mean, it's a very small footprint for this proposed garage and it wouldn't, uh, it, though it, it's not an environmentally sensitive area, it's not within the shoreland zone. All those in favor of number six being met, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will agree with that as well, yes. Number seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area or flood hazard zone. Mr. Longstaff, could you answer that for all of us? Uh, yes, it's correct. I can verify that it's not in the shoreland zone, nor is it currently in a flood zone. Uh, I don't even believe it's in the, the uh, flood zone if uh, when, once the preliminary uh, FEMA maps are adopted. So I think it's it's safe from both of those. Understood. Okay, Mr. Bork, do you have anything to, what, what is your vote on this? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Uh, Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I agree as well. It is not an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, at this point, um, Mr. Longstaff, we will vote on the motion, the application as a whole. Um, well, you still have one more criteria. Uh, to excuse me. Number A, strict application of the dimensional standards of the zoning ordinance will both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the residential two district and result in significant, in significant economic injury to the applicant. Uh, Mr. Bork. Yes, unfortunately, uh, th there definitely is significant economic injury here. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, this would really force the Rossiters to have to sell their house, unfortunately, and uh, look for another place where they can have a garage. Uh, so, yeah, I th think that that one is, certainly has been met. And um, there, it's really, it is a permitted use, certainly. So I agree with that. Uh, so it's a, it's a difficult situation, unfortunately, and, uh, but it is what it is. Mr. Karen? I tend to disagree in that um, it appears that over the past several years, there have been a proper use of the, of the site and the house and the property um, based upon other circumstances the requested need for a garage, um, I do not feel would cause significant economic injury. Uh, I do understand and sympathize that there could potentially be repercussions, um, but those would not be solely based upon this garage. Ms. Shoup. Yeah, you know, again, I think, again, the board is kind of sympathetic to the situation that they're in. Um, you know, this is the, the lot that they choose to buy. Um, they bought a house or a small lot by the beach that didn't have a garage. And um, I really, especially in this real estate market, you know, a garage is a deal breaker. Um, you know, there are other places to go. I, I don't see the significant economic injury to not being able to have a garage. I didn't have a garage before and lots of people don't have garages in Maine. Um, so I don't think. Understood. Um, 
an accessory building garage is permitted in the zone. Um, however, it's it's permitted but not required, and not everybody has one. And in, in that area, some some houses do, and some houses do not. Um, and there is no other. I'll note that there is no other real place to locate a functioning garage on this property. Uh, with that being said, all those in favor of point number eight being met, Mr. Bork. Yes. Mr. Karen. No. Ms. Shoup. No. Uh, and I will vote no on this one as well. There really is no other <clears throat> way around this one, unfortunately. So that one does not work. So at this time, we're going to, I would like to see a motion on the floor for the application of appeal number 2695. Mr. Bork. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, motion to approve appeal number 2695. Motion. Second. That's a second from Mr. Karen. Any discussion, further discussion on the on the motion? No. Okay, seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion, Mr. Bork? No. Mr. Karen? No. Ms. Shoup? No. And uh, I will vote no as well because it did not meet the requirements of one of the criteria in the application. So we're deeply sympathetic, but unfortunately that is the ruling of the board this evening but thank you very much for your time next we'll hear uh, appeal number 2699 practical difficulty variance appeal by northeast civil solutions on behalf of patricia and curtis deegan 7 avenue 2 assessors map u022 lot 62. mr longstaff would you give us a brief background of this application please Yeah, yes, excuse me, Mr. Chair. I was just preparing the screen for the next application. Of course. Um, give me just one moment. Of course. Talk amongst yourselves. Let everyone get your paperwork in order. Mr. Chair and uh, board members, uh, the next application uh, for an appeal is for, uh, again, for a practical difficulty variance. Uh, this one is at uh, 7 Avenue 2 down at Pine Point. It's uh, the applicant uh, and owner are Curtis and Patricia Deegan. Um, they have uh, a 1900 vintage cottage um, on a I think this one is a 5,003 square foot lot, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, it's, it's 0.11, uh, 0 0.11 acre lot. In the R4A district, uh, the parcel, like the last one, is a non-conforming existing uh, lot. And the structure that's on it is non-conforming with regard to the side and front yard setbacks. Uh, the maximum lot coverage permitted by buildings in, in this district is 25%. Um, the appellant is ap appealing to be able to raise the existing structure, in other words, remove it and uh, replace it uh, with a 1,233 square foot uh, two-story dwelling uh, with a deck. Um, and they're looking to place this within 10 feet of the north side yard and 11.5 feet of this, or 12, I think it's 12 feet actually from the south side yard. Um, and uh, within 12.2 feet of the front uh, property line. And so those, those are the, the uh, setback uh, relief uh, that they're looking for. Um, and uh, they're, uh, proposing to reduce the amount of non-vegetated and or impervious surface uh, from the existing uh, structures now uh, down by uh, some six, a little over 600 uh, square feet in doing so. Um, 
and I'll at this point turn it over to the applicants to give you further information on what they're proposing and I'll try to bring up uh, uh, as soon as Jim gives me the thumbs up I'll I'll share my screen and bring those uh, plans up for the board to look at. Is it Jim or is it Brandon, Mr. Bennett? Either one. Uh, it'll be both of uh, them. But Excellent. yes, can you please bring up the site plan? All righty, can you all hear me? Yes, sir, whenever you're ready. All righty. So, hi, my name is Brandon Bennett. I'm here with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, to my left, I have Jim Fisher with NCS as well. To my right, I have Jim Bernard, which is the architect and also the builder. And on the other side of the table, I have Patricia and Curtis Degon with us. So we will be able to kind of answer any questions that come along. Um, so kind of recap a little bit of what Brian already touched upon. The parcel in question is 7 Avenue 2. Uh, it's located on map U22, lot 62, uh, located in the zone R4A. Uh, currently, as uh, Brian stated, the lot is 5,003 square feet as depicted on our boundary survey. Uh, so please feel free to look at that with any questions. Uh, simply, we are asking for a variance on the front setback of 17.8 feet, uh, which imposes 12.2 as Brian stated. The north side, uh, it is originally 15 feet. We're asking for a variance of five. On the south side as well, 15 feet is the setback. Uh, we are asking for a variance of three. Currently, the house is very, very close. If you look at it to the actual front property setback, uh, to the front property boundary line, I'm sorry. And we are pushing it back to try and meet conformance in that regard. I also want to point out that the garage is set much farther back and is closer to the north side setback boundary line. And we are pulling it back from that side as well as the other side. Please take a close look. You'll see the dark line shows that we are bringing it more into conformance on both sides and including the rear uh, to that. To, speaking to that, we are making uh, the new building smaller. Uh, the current building coverage allowed on the lot, as you'll see on the plan to the right. Uh, could you please scroll to the right? We have a table there that should be able to show uh, all of our numbers. You'll see that there is a 25% building coverage. It is about 31% on the existing, and we are bringing it down to 29-ish percent. Uh, we're trying to make the lot better to the best of our ability. Uh, we are bringing the lot back to make it more conforming to the neighboring properties and character to make it more fit more into the character of the neighborhood, but also we don't want to disturb the character of the neighborhood by bringing it all the way back into the building setback that would kind of throw the rest of the neighborhood out of what we're trying to do and it would look rather strange. I do want to point out that the pictures that were included in the packet shows that the house is in a rather poor condition. You have a lot of settling, a lot of cracking, and a lot of moving of the structure. Uh, due to Jim Bernard's estimates, we were able to see that trying to save the house would actually be substantially more expensive than to tear it down and rebuild. Uh, doing this so will actually make the environment better. We're bringing it down uh, from pervious coverage about 682 square feet, which will allow for better infiltration and bring down the ski, uh, peak storm water flow on the site, um, which also will talk about the significant injury to the property, uh, uh, to the applicants, I'm sorry. Uh, if the house is not taken care of, uh, it's going to be substantially more expensive to keep it going uh, compared to carrying it down. Uh, in that regard, I'm going to kind of turn it over to any kind of questions we have to Jim Bernard uh, for the architectural drawings and or if uh, Patricia and Curtis would like to speak, uh, they're more than happy to hear.
Well, I guess we're just hoping that we can uh, replace the existing house that's there that we've loved for 26 years um, and have tried to maintain it and to make it safer with uh, what's happened. We've um, had a number of repairs done to it, but we just feel it's uh, beyond continuing to repair and we're in the position now where we'd love to be able to replace it. Uh, and to that, uh, we can open the board to any questions they have that are kind of they're thinking about or we can move along with the application. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, are there any questions from the board at this time? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Mr. Karen, go ahead. Uh, the first question, um, based upon the plans, uh, there is a given square footage for the new building. Um, by chance, is the existing square footage of the existing building known? Uh, yes, let's see. The existing uh, total building coverage is 1,550.7 square feet compared to the new uh, proposed, which would be 1,485 square feet. Um, I sent over some comments uh, showing my math to Brian Longstaff earlier this week, and I believe he concurred with my math uh, showing that, so. All right, thank you. A follow-up question. The existing garage, how many uh, vehicles does it, um, is you are usable uh currently the garage holds two cars and the proposed correct me if i'm wrong is intended to only hold one yeah. yes yeah. yes uh as of the site is or the existing property is intended to be raised and all new construction um could would it be possible to hear some thoughts uh based on why the maximum 25 percent lot coverage uh, would need to be exceeded. Um, based on the uh, the house right now um, and the garage that's there, by reducing everything, the actual house is getting smaller, um, and uh, as is the garage. So, uh, in terms of the overall square footage, including the footprint, which is considerably smaller, uh, we're actually reducing the size of the habitable area. Uh, can it go down to 25% um, with the garage in there? And, and keeping in mind, again, we, we'd like to be able to have the garage here and the house needs to be elevated to be able to get that above what the new floodplain is going to be. Um, so to pour that in the actual habitable space of the garage, when you see the house, uh, when you saw the elevation drawings of the house, it looks a lot bigger than its habitable space is actually going to make it, primarily because it has to be elevated above the new floodplain. Uh, right now, it's not in the floodplain, but it will be. Uh, this is coming up either sometime this summer or shortly thereafter, depending on when FEMA actually uh, um, gets everything uh, in, um, into effect. So uh, as far as the habitable area is concerned, um, it's smaller than it is right now, and it doesn't look as big as it actually appears on the screen or on the elevation drawing. All right, thank you very much. Another question, please. Go ahead, Mr. Bork. Is the deck uh, considered part of uh, coverage? Yes, it is. Uh, if now, how, how far are you exceeding the 25% right now? Uh, about 6% right now. We're exceeding okay, so it with the existing. And with the new, down. all right. And you're proposing the new building would exceed the 25% also then, right? That's correct. It will be about 2% ish less. Uh, than the existing. So we're actually and, bringing it down. And just, and I noticed that the size of that deck is quite large. Uh, it's smaller than the existing uh, deck that's there now, actually. Okay. But it's you're still exceeding the 25% with this proposal. Is that correct? That's yes. correct. 2%. Okay. Any other questions from the board? None from Karen? Okay, then let's get into the questions. Um, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions in the neighborhood. 
Uh, yes, the, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. The property is a legally non-conforming parcel and is burdened by the significant setbacks that were placed in the parcel along with when the lot was created, resulting in an extremely small building envelope for the lot size. The proposed dwelling is designed to meet the neighborhood character better than the existing structure. Due to the small building envelope, in order to construct a new home of a reasonable size that fits in and complies with the other homes in an area, a practical difficulty variance is required. The small nature of the lot and zoning constraints only allow for a 20 foot wide building envelope, equating to an inside building measurement of approximately 17 feet with one foot uh, eaves considered, uh, including the walls as well, which is too small to effectively design and live in a home that will match the existing character of the neighborhood. Uh, the necessary variance is due to the zoning constraints uh, implemented after the existing lot was created. I will want to point out that the house was built about 120-ish years ago, uh, which was substantially earlier than what is currently there now for all the other new structures. Excellent. Thank you. Number two, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. It will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Uh, the granting of the variance will not alter the central character of the neighborhood. The proposed structure is designed to make the lot and house thereon look more conforming relative to the houses on the abutting properties while attempting to meet the zoning requirements to the greatest practical extent. The existing structure is significantly non-conforming and virtually falling down. Granting of the variance will allow for the proposed structure to fit in even better with the other houses in the neighborhood, enhancing the conformity of the structure and the, the essential character of the area as a whole. Excellent, thank you. Number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. The practical difficulty placed on this parcel is due to the zoning constraints put into place long after the lot was created and the original house was built. It is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. The existing zoning regulations once placed on the parcel made the lot a legally non-conforming lot and a legally non-conforming dwelling. Due to the restrictions placed on the lot by the municipal zoning, any construction after the adoption of the current zoning regulations on the locust parcel would result in a need to grant a variance by the Zoning Board of Appeals in order to keep the character with the abutting properties in the neighborhood. Thank you. Number four, no feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. There are no other reasonable alternatives except the variance. The closest portion of the current structure is located 3.81 feet from the north side property line, which is an extension of 11.19 into the building setback. The proposed structure will only extend five feet into the north side building setback, bringing the proposed structure more into conformance with the lot. The existing structure extends 23.3 into the front setback, while the proposed structure is being pulled back and only extending 17.8 into the front setback. This allows for the structure to be more conforming while still matching the character of the abutting properties. The existing garage currently stands 2.97 feet from the south side property line, extending 12.03 feet into the setback while the proposed structure will only extend three feet into the setback, pulling the structure significantly further back from the line. In conjunction with, in conjunction with making the structure more conformant, we are proposing a smaller building footprint, locating the structure more toward the center of the lot and proposing that structure will be located more inside the building envelope while keeping the aesthetic character of the neighborhood. All right, thank you. Question, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Bork, go ahead. Okay. I'll try to be quickly. Uh, did you do a, a cost estimate on uh, comparing the cost of rebuilding the existing structure to bring it up to standards to the cost of building this brand new structure? And if so, could, could you please tell us what those numbers are? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, I submitted them to Brian Longstaff. Uh, I want to pull them up. I do know it's about a hundred. A difference. All right, here we go. So 
to repair uh, and reconstruct of the existing structure, it would come out to a total of $536,600 estimated. Uh, the demolition and reconstruction of the home and the new garage would come out to about $430,200, which is about $110,000-ish difference uh, Thank you. from one to the other. All right, great. Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Uh, the proposed development will decrease the total impervious area by approximately 682 square feet. Reducing the impervious area will not produce an adverse effect on the natural environment and will actually bring down the peak flow of stormwater runoff, allowing more stormwater to infiltrate into the pervious ground. This project will not affect the natural environment. All right, thank you. The property is not located in a hole or in part within a shoreland area as defined or at a flood hazard, flood hazard zone is defined by the town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. Um, uh, yes, the property is not located within the shoreland zone area as depicted on the town of Scarborough's GIS system. Great, thank you. Uh, and number eight, uh, please demonstrate how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the zone in which it is located and would also result in significant economic injury to the client, to the applicant, excuse me. The existing house on the parcel is a legally non-conforming structure and the lot itself is a legally non-conforming parcel. Both the existing structure and parcel itself are deemed non-conforming by the rules set forth by the code in implemented by the town. The structure is encroaching within the primary front setbacks due to the relatively small building envelope and the result of the 30 foot front building setback. No dwelling can be constructed that is intended to return reasonable yield for the parcel while keeping the natural character of the neighborhood. The existing dwelling is dilapidated and re would require significant renovations if the structure were to be retained. The cost of retra retaining the structure would be significantly higher the than to the, to the cost to raz and rebuild new. As we talked about earlier, it's about $110,000 difference, uh, which you can confirm with Brian Longstaff as the builder's uh, estimated cost. Um, the new proposed structure will improve the parcel neighborhood. One, the parcel is not currently in the flood zone, but will be subject to a greater flood hazard once the new FEMA flood maps go into effect. The proposed house will be constructed to address the new proposed flood maps. Two, the current basement foundation suffers from mold, mildew, lead-based paint, and needs to be filled in. Due, it, it needs to be filled in not only due to structural integrity problems, but because it is extremely susceptible to flooding if it has left as it is. Three, the new structure is in in this area requires elevation of the structure and to elevate the first floor above the floodplain. If this is not feasible or even possible due to the structural integrity of the existing house. The applicant proposes to construct a new dwelling to ensure the use and safety of the house based on the current building codes. The existing house is in its present condition is virtually unsellable unless it is razed and rebuilt. That would provide a reasonable return of the property for the Dugans and future owners given that there is virtually no reasonable return if the house is left as it is, and if this practical difficulty variance is not granting. granted. Not granting this variance and or trying to fix the structure in its current state will cause the applicant to suffer a significant economic injury. The proposed structure will address the new flood hazards, ensure future longevity of the structure, and approve the flood plan, uh, sorry, uh, for the structure will be above the flood plain, meanwhile reducing nonconformity with the applicable setbacks. Excellent, thank you. At this time, we're gonna open the floor to any public comment. Mr. Longstaff, have we received any emails, written letters, telephone calls from any, from anyone uh, from the public regarding this? Yes, Mr. Chair, before I, before I read those, uh, I just want to clarify, did did everyone on the board receive the packet that included the contractor's analysis and the estimated costs? Okay, I just wanted to verify that you did receive that. Um, okay, good. Um, yes, we received four, I believe four letters uh, 
Um, first one was from Barbara Maselli. Um, she resides at 9 Avenue 2. The purpose of this letter is to show my support for the proposed project at 7 Avenue 2. Scarborough, Maine, Kurt and Pat Dugan. I have reviewed the draft plans by NCS and I am in support of these changes. Feel free to reach me if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, we received another letter from Charles Heselton, 39 Jones Creek Drive. Uh, he says, I am writing to express my support for the project being proposed by Kurt and Pat Degon on 7 Avenue 2, Scarborough, Maine. The Degons have been in the neighborhood and contributors to our community for more than 25 years. Both Kurt and Pat have been watchful and helpful for all of us, whether it is a weather issue, safety issue, or maintenance need. Kurt is always offering to lend a hand and has gone above and beyond to help keep our path to the beach clear and safe with trash, recycling, et cetera, et cetera. All glowing stuff, I want to add. They have one of the oldest houses on the street, but have done all they can to keep it looking well kept. This is not an easy task in our area with homes that have no foundation on 100 plus year old tree trunk piers. The building construction that is more than a century old, you know, you may not know this from looking at the house uh, from the street because the Degons won't want to hurt the neighborhood aesthetic. However, their garage is visibly becoming a concern along with the roof uh, shingles and outside envelopes showing significant issues. Their home foundation has shifted significantly, requiring three occasions for them to hire contractors to try to firm up the house structure. I have no concerns and only support them, uh, only support for them to build a safe home and enable them to remain as good neighbors for many of us. A third letter, uh, actually an email uh, from Nathan Bryce. Uh, I was speaking with my neighbor, my neighbors, Kurt and Pat Degon in Pine Point, and they shared the building plans for their new home at 7 Avenue 2. I think they did a really nice job of designing a beautiful home and one that will fit the character of the street. I am in full support of their plans. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And a uh, fourth email from Paul Kaiser. Um, Paul Kaiser is at 5 Avenue 2 in Scarborough. Uh, he says, uh, dear Mr. Longstaff, Kurt and Patty Degon have been our good neighbors for many years. We have viewed their proposal to replace their house and have no issues with their plan. The proposed house will be a significant improvement in the appearance of the property, while also improving the privacy of both of our outdoor spaces. Thank you, Paul R. Kaiser. That's all I have for letters and emails. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Longstaff. <clears throat> I'll say if anyone is in the public who would like to speak, I currently do not see any attendees, uh, only the panelists that are here right now. Seeing no more wishes for public comment, I will close the floor to public comment. Now we will enter the session with just the board members only as we discuss all the- Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, may I uh, request that I just make a quick conclusion to the uh, presentation that we just made before the public hearing? Uh, I'll, I'll allow it, Jim. Great, thank you. Um, I would just like to point out, as Brandon very articulately mentioned, that um, this is really a win-win situation all the way around. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, in this particular case, when we're looking at the overall house in context with the overall neighborhood, um, I would just call attention to the fact that, again, as Brandon mentioned, this house and its, uh, or the structures in its closest point are a little over three feet to one side, a little less than three feet on the other, and uh, only about six plus feet from the front. And uh, we're bringing that back to 10 feet from the side, 12 feet from the other side, and pushing it back almost double uh, the distance from uh, where it sits currently. When you take a look at your packets, and you'll see the photograph of the overall street or the overall neighborhood in which this house is located, you'll notice that uh, all of the other houses, uh, not just some of them, all of them, are actually uh, built up. They're almost in a straight line, not quite, but uh, they're all very, very close to the roads which is essentially what we're looking for um, it to be able to do here, yet still move it back and it's uh, to improve the non-conformity by pushing it back a little bit. Um, this is again, you know, these types of issues that we had with Higgins Beach over the, over the decades, uh, where we're trying to bring the houses actually a little bit closer to the road. But uh, in this particular case, um, because the, uh, the Pine Point area hasn't, uh, the zoning there hasn't changed yet, uh, like at Higgins, uh, we are trying to make it back to make it a little bit uh, less non-conforming. 
uh, and overall lot size as well. Again, as we mentioned, it's decreased. So everything about this proposal is better than what's there right now. And again, take a look at the photographs as well, and you'll see that uh, as the neighbors also stated, this building is one of the it's one of the greatest examples of buildings that are almost ready to fall down that uh, we've seen in this particular area and uh, does need to be redone. And with the building envelope that would support a house, an inside uh, house of only 17 feet, uh, it really fits quite well into the neighborhood the way uh, Mr. Bernard, Jim Bernard has uh, designed it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Okay, now to the board. We'll go through each of the criteria, we'll vote on each one, and then we'll vote for the entire appeal at the very end. So number one, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Mr. Bork, you go first. Uh, while the house uh, or the lot itself is very similar to other lots in the neighborhood, what is unique about this one is the condition of the house itself. And I think you made a very good case for why the house should be replaced. So I think that you know that's that's certainly a unique situation with the home itself, not the not the lot. Okay, thank you, Mr. Karen. Agreed. Uh, based on the age of the property and the existing condition, um, I do believe that it is more um, the need is more based upon the property in regard uh, rather than the neighborhood itself. Thank you, Mr. Karen Mashup. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Karen and Mr. Bork. Um, I actually, I don't normally say that, but I actually think this is somewhat unique to find a property this dilapidated down there that is visually just, you know, and as the neighbors said, they're great neighbors, but they really need to fix up their house. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, important to me after reading through the material um, as part of an 1888 subdivision of Pine Point, um, just maintaining a structure like that for so many years is certainly uh, a challenge and a burden. Um, they've done well to keep it up as much as they have throughout the years. Um, I'll note that uh, this is a single family dwelling with a detached garage. Um, and just over the years, as time goes on, everything needs to be replaced. So, Mr. Bork, uh, your vote on this number one part of criteria. <clears throat> yes. Yes, Mr. Karen. Yes. Ms. Shoup. Yes. And I will vote yes as well on this one. Number two, the granting of variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Mr. Bork. Uh, this will be a considerable upgrade to the property itself and also to the value of the neighborhood. Mr. Karen. Agreed. I do not see anything within the proposed application that would have an undesirable change or detrimental impact on the abutting neighbors or properties. Everything, well, as we'll discuss later, um, this will, I see as an improvement. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, Ms. Shoup? Agreed, I think they easily met this criteria. Thank you, and I, I, I would agree as well. I think um, with the dwelling 26 feet wide, approximately 27 feet high, um, you know, we're looking at a little over 1,200, between 12 and 1,300 square feet of living space in two stories. Um, you have an issue with a Dagon uh, household, and forgive me for the mispronunciation of your last name earlier. Um, the proposed coverage is technically smaller than what is existing now. Um, so I'd like to point that out as well. So all of those, we'll be looking at uh, the voting on number two, Mr. Bork. Yes. Mr. Karen. Yes. Ms. Shoup. Yeah. And I will vote in the affirmative as well. Number four. Uh, excuse me, number three, uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner, Mr. Bork. No, it is not. Mr. Karen. Agreed. I do not see any um, issues from the applicant previously or a prior owner, and I'm not sure where else to mention it, but I do want to say that I appreciate the additional information uh, included within the packet, such as the reports uh, with regard to the structure. I appreciate that as well. Ms. Shoup? Agreed. Excellent. I mean, as stated, this was built in the uh, before 1900 and uh, approximately 1888, long before the zoning ordinance was in place. Excuse me. Mr. Bork, what is your vote on this? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. And Ms. Shoup? 
Yes. And I will vote yes as well. Number four, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Mr. Bork. The applicant has uh, clearly showed that uh, this is the only reasonable alternative. Uh, and while there is a considerable reduction uh, in the uh, lot coverage, uh, it is still, you know, 10 is it 2% over. That's approximately 100 square feet. It is still a considerable reduction in lot coverage. And I think that's still a reasonable amount. Mr. Karen. Reed has mentioned there are um, some potential future environmental impacts that they have taken into consideration, especially with re uh, elevating the proposed structure. Um, so no concern. Ms. Uh, Ms. Shoup? Yeah, agreed. I mean, again, they're, they're working with a really small lot there, so they're trying to do the best they can with what they got. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I'll note as well, um, the applicant, ha they they did provide one plan for the structure and they did, they did not show uh, other variations of possible plans here, but we assume this is the best plan that would fit on the property that was mentioned. Um, one note that I wanted to mention as well, forgive me, I wrote, I wrote it down, I shuffled my papers about here. Um, they included a cost estimate as well, and that'll probably play into another question and answer that we have later, but having the cost estimate there showing that there is a significant um, economic injury, and again, this plays into number eight, but uh, I thought that would be appropriate to mention it here as well. Um, nearly $100,000 in savings by just going with a new construction rather than um, raising the building, or rather than uh, renovating the building in place. Um, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I'll vote yes as well on this. Uh, number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Mr. Bork. The new building with reduced lot coverage will actually improve uh, the amount of water runoff uh, and impact on the environment. Mr. Karen? Uh, speaking to, pardon me, we're speaking to question five. Yes, we are. Thank you. Uh, I agree that the reduction in overall building footprint as compared to the existing is a reduction, um, that there's an attempt to uh, come within greater conformance for existing setbacks and boundaries and then the existing structure. And while they may be exceeded in both uh, regards, it is an overall reduction and would become uh, in greater conformance with the nearby structures. Ms. Shoup? Yeah, I agree with Mr. Karen. You know, the reduction of the footprint generally, I think, is them taking an action to be more in conformance. And I agree. Uh, and any chance to reduce non conformance, especially in a town where we have so many non conformities with just lots that have been created before ordinance have been taken place, is always, uh, is always a positive thing. Mr. Bork, your vote? Uh, yes, and pardon me for jumping ahead to six on the on this question, on the comments. So that's a yes, Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. Number six, <clears throat> the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Mr. Bork? Yes, I've made my comment. Excellent, Mr. Karen. I agree with Mr. Bork with regard to uh, reduced roof area um, for reduced stormwater runoff. And as I previously mentioned, there is the concern uh, with elevating the structure for the floodplain. And I do not see any adverse effects on the environment. Ms. Shoup? Yeah, agreed. I mean, with the elevation and decrease of the lot coverage, I think that's more that won't have an adverse effect. Excellent, thank you. And the looking at the technical term that the town of Scarborough uses, we're reducing the amount of non-vegetated or impervious area. Um, and I think that is very important to note here. Mr. Bork, what is your vote? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. The property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area. 
or in a flood hazard zone as defined in the town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. Um, Mr. Brian, you have confirmed that we are not in a floodplain hazard zone. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it's currently not in the floodplain as Mr. Fisher had alluded to earlier. The preliminary 2017 FEMA maps do have it in a floodplain, and that's one of the reasons why they want to. Um, I'm sure why the the applicant wants to rebuild and and uh, elevate that structure to the proper um, height above base flood. Uh, it is not in the shoreland zone, so that doesn't change, and not unless and not unless the coastal sand dune moves well inland from where it is now. <laughs> We'll see what happens in 30 years. <laughs> Maybe someday. Um, but the important thing, the important thing here is proven that is not in, not in this zone today as observed by the town and the state of Maine. And that is what we are looking at here. I don't believe anybody has any uh, additional comment for that one. So Mr. Bork, your vote? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. Uh, last, number eight, please demonstrate this, how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the zone of which is located. It would also result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Mr. Bort. I think the applicant has shown the economic uh, uh, injury. Um, this is a clearly the most economically feasible alternative rather than attempting to rebuild the existing structure. Not only that, but uh, it's, while we need to, you would need to anticipate your know, future damage uh, with, with rising seas and by elevating the structure, you know, this certainly helps prevent future damage. That's an important point to make. Mr. Karen. <clears throat> I appreciate the information provided in the packet, um, providing the comparison of costs for renovating the existing and raising the existing structure as compared to building new, uh, which helps support the package. And I agree that based upon the age and current condition of the, um, the building and structure that the economic injury has been, uh, has been shown, potential injury has been shown. Ms. Shoup. Yeah, I think the applicants done a really good job at demonstrating a significant economic injury between trying to work with the property now and trying to, you know, up completely replace it and bring it up to kind of the situations of today. You know, they give us a quote for what it would replace to work with what they have, but I mean, then what happens when it starts to flood and other things start to happen? I mean, that's like a very rough estimate of replacing the home, but not what they would be facing with a home that is not, you know, in conformance with being near the shoreland and elevating it and things like that. Um, I, I honestly think this is a great example of, a, you know, a significant economic injury that they would have if they didn't get this this evening. Thank you. And I agree as well. Um, it's, it's nice to see how they're being very proactive and they've shown the evidence here through the cost estimate done by um, a professional cost estimator of how um, the cost to just renovate a building in place is significantly more expensive, but does not address um, future potential issues in the area that may not be recognized by the town and the ordinance today, but very well maybe tomorrow. Uh, so we do like to see that. Uh, let's see, Mr. Bork, your vote on this, please. Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I'll vote yes on this as well. Do I have a motion uh, for appeal number 2699? Mr. Bork? Mr. Chair, yes. Motion to approve appeal number 2699. Second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, Mr. Bork? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Ms. Shoup? Yes. And I'll vote yes as well. The motion passes. The appeal 2699 is approved. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, at the, we're now at the end of the meeting here. Any additional comments that folks want to make? I have a couple. Um, I did briefly. Um, I joined a new committee. It's well, it's just a, a subcommittee. It's called the Charter Review Committee for the Town of Scarborough. And we met last night for the first time. And what we're going to be working on is actually uh, revising the town charter. 
So we are gonna be looking for resident feedback. Um, I think I'm friends with some of you guys on social media and things like that. So they are gonna be sending out like questionnaires and things. So I just encourage my zoning board members and all the residents who are watching this evening <laughs> to keep their eyes out and please, you know, be active in that part of, you know, updating our charter and making Scarborough better. Any other comments for it, Mr. Karen? Uh, I just one one that I would like to briefly make. Um, I know uh, during the during the discussions of the questions with the applicant tonight, I did allow questions from us back to the applicant and the presenter. In the future, I'm going to not allow that as those questions should be done at the very beginning. Um, I'm still I'm learning a few things here and trying to make my way through it. So, uh, in in an extreme in an extreme. Uh, case i will will let those go obviously we can't be stringent all the time there have to be exceptions but generally going forward please keep your questions at the beginning uh, when we have the questions from the board to the applicant uh, mr longstaff do you have anything else can i clarify James? yes yes please so I'm, i guess i'm confused um so like i felt this evening we were asking questions after each question of the applicant are you when do you want us to ask them questions um, so after the applicant presents, right. uh, gives the general presentation, um, and then at that point, I'll say, does the board have any questions on the, the information that was presented in the packet? And now's the time for us to ask questions. Then when we go through the questions, for instance, tonight with the practical difficulty one through eight, those should just be um, the answers from the applicant. So we can't ask questions at the end of the applicant's presentation before public hearing. I correct. Okay. Uh, yes, and and I would like. No, 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 no. I don't think that is correct. It is not correct. But please correct. You listen me. to what she said. <laughs> if you listen to what she said, she said we can't ask. Can, can we not ask questions at the end of the applicant's presentation before public hearing? Thank you. Okay, so so that's still the presentation. That's still the question and answer and back and forth between the board and the applicant, as I understand it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Karen. If I'm if I'm misstating it, I think that's what you're saying. Is you're still having that discussion, and then when that's over and the board has no long no more questions, then uh, the chair would open it for public comment. And that's done before the applicant gives their response. No, is that done before the applicant gives their responses? It's, it's it's after the applicant gives their responses. Public hearing is after the applicant gives their responses. Okay, Correct. I stand corrected, and I'm sorry. I I thought I thought that was the uh, thing, but yeah, um, I I think I think uh, what what you're saying, Mr. Chair, is that you'd like to try to get as many questions out of the way before the applicant officially reads his responses. And Correct. And, and I don't want I'm not sure I I'm not sure I'm all on board with that, but that's your call. <laughs> okay, no, and that, that's fine. And we let's 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 kind of if there is a question that you do need to ask in there, by all means, we will we will ask it. But I guess my um, my preference would be to try to have those ahead of time as we go. But obviously, if the applicant does say something in their presentation or their answer of one of the questions that uh, that we want to have clarification on. Uh, if it's in direct response to that, then uh, I think that is perfectly okay to ask, which is what we all did tonight. So, Jim, the concern I have is that if the applicant doesn't cover something that's very important, we should speak up at that moment before we go on to the next question. That happened a couple of times tonight. Mm. Good point. No, I, I, I appreciate the feedback and you're right. So as we as we go forward, Please keep doing what you're doing. But I, I do, I do ask that if um, you know any, uh, keep the questions pertinent to just what the applicant is stating in their answer for each of the application questions. Um, not that I, I worry about any of us going on a tangent. It would be me, but I want to just make sure that uh, um, we just try to keep everything compartmentalized and efficient as we can. So that's all I have to say about that. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Um, before that, I uh, just yes. want to uh, remind the board, I believe uh, if we keep our fingers crossed that uh, for the February meeting, we'll have, I think, two new board members uh, approved and appointed by council. So I think 
possibly for the first time in a long time, we'll have a full slate um, of board members. So I think that's good news. I apologize, I forgot to, uh, I, it's probably premature if I even could remember their names, but we'll introduce them next time. I forgot to write them down. And again, it probably isn't, isn't the right time to do that anyway, but I think it's great news. And I really appreciate the fact that people are still out there volunteering uh, to do this important work. God knows it's not, um, it's tedious sometimes and, and uh, you don't have a lot of flowers thrown at your feet, but it's it's important work nonetheless, as we saw tonight. And uh, I do, uh, as always, appreciate all of uh, the board members' uh, commitment and time and sacrifice away from kids and homework and and uh, all the good things that uh, we could be doing in the, in the last two, two hours. But I uh, just wanted to mention that um, and, and probably, uh, I don't know if this is, is appropriate either. It strikes me as, I just have it as an aside comment. It strikes me as funny when, um, when everybody uh, talks about these narrow building envelopes and it's only 20 feet and how could anyone ever live in a house that was 20 feet wide? And I lived the first seven years of my marriage in a 14 foot wide mobile home <laughs> without a garage, by the way. Um, did just fine, but apparently we can no longer do that now. And I'm not sure, maybe I can't do that anymore. I don't not, know. Not in Scarborough, Brian, come on. <laughs> Certainly not in Scarborough, not unless you're in the RFM district <laughs> for mobile homes, but um, just- State manufactured uh, homes. They have there you go, homes. mobile home, uh, uh, manufactured homes. Manufactured homes, yes. homes I, Brian. I apologize, it's when manufactured. I, I lived in a mobile home. I, I, I make no, no excuses for that or no apologies. I lived in a mobile Mobile home. She was mobile, baby. Were the uh, were the wheels <laughs> off of yours? No, they were not. Oh, yeah, you definitely. They, they were on block. They were up on blocks, but they were well, not. Of course, off. yeah, 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 yeah. It has to be up on blocks. That's yes. my point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. They have to be able to get out of there in a hurry. And, Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so with that, uh, and I just want to uh, wish everyone a happy New Year. This is great. We're into a new year. Hopefully, we'll have a, a much uh, less strenuous and stressful year as, as we. Uh, left. So I'm looking forward to a new board, uh, or at least par partially new board and uh, hopefully a good year. So again, thank you all. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate your efforts and Doreen and Jay and everyone else there as well. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor, Bork, Karen, Shoup. Yeah, yeah. Aye. That is a unanimous aye. Thank you all very much for joining us. Have a great night. Yeah. Good night. Take care.